might be turning in your Bible to Matthew chapter 9. I almost said Malachi. Matthew chapter 9. Although if you turn to Malachi, you won't be far. As all of you know, who are members here at least, you know that we have recently uh, engaged in a deacon selection process, and we've tried to find some men who can serve our congregation as deacons and helping us with our outreach efforts to our visitors who are coming, and how can we retain those visitors, how can we set up studies with them, which, would hope, uh, which we hope will lead to more conversions. Uh, our elders will have some more to say about that soon, and we hope to, um, to increase our efforts, not just with these two or three deacons uh, who are selected and, and appointed to this, but, but through whatever process they might use, other people whom they might use uh, to help in this effort. But these newly appointed deacons are going to have a special emphasis on reaching these visitors. But I don't want the rest of us who may not be one of those deacons to sit back and say, well, you know, there's some visitors that just came in the door and, well, I think we have a deacon for that. So I'm just going to leave them alone. No, all of us, whether we're a deacon or not, whether we are young or old, man or woman, adult, child, college student, it, it doesn't matter. All of us need to be helping in this effort to reach people who are coming into our doors. Because, as I said earlier, that can lead to studies. That may lead to conversions. This is a great effort that we can put forward in evangelism. Now, we're not going to convert everyone who comes and visits. In fact, we may not convert most. We never know until we sit down with that person and we scatter the seed. It is up to them to decide how they respond to the teaching of the Word of God. But what we are seeking is the opportunity to present the teaching of the Word of God. And each one of us can play a role in this. Everyone can help. And I know when we talk about evangelism, when we use that word, I know sometimes we... We just kind of shut down a little bit because maybe, maybe evangelism is just not for me. I know there are some who are thinking, I'm not really gifted in that area. I can't teach someone the gospel. And you may have various reasons for thinking that that's so. Maybe the reason is, well, I just don't think I know enough. And that reason, I understand it is challenging when someone asks me to articulate the nuances of Revelation chapter 20 to them. But here's the thing. No one has ever asked me to do that. Most people in our world today are extremely biblically illiterate. I had a study with a man one time. We met in a coffee shop and we were talking about the Bible, just the, the book itself. How many books are in it? How is it divided? Some of these basic things that we might take for granted that people in the world ought to know. And this man told me that he thought the books of the Bible were listed in alphabetical order. And I thought, okay, Genesis, Exodus. Well, clearly they're not. But I think we might be surprised at how little Bible knowledge people in the world have. So let's not have this idea that, well, I, I just, I, I'm afraid I'm going to get a question I can't answer. Or maybe someone is going to, to be uh, f much deeper than I am in their thinking. Well, that could happen. It could happen. But it's not very likely to happen. You are probably much more capable than you realize and you could have a study with someone. You could lead them to understand the simple truths of the gospel. But let's just understand, let's, let's say, or let's accept rather, maybe this is right. Evangelism is not for everybody, and I think that's true. There are some who may be more naturally gifted in that area than others. I get that. But the lesson this morning 
is a lesson about evangelism, but it is a lesson for every single person. This morning, we're going to talk about five things that every person can do in evangelism. Every person. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that. It doesn't matter if you are young or old. It doesn't matter if you are spiritually strong and mature or if you're a new convert who's only been a Christian for a relatively short period of time. It does not matter your situation. There are at least five things that you can do to help our congregation in evangelism. And that's what I want to talk with you about this morning. Years ago, I heard Brother Max Dawson, you may remember him, he came and spent a weekend with us about three years ago. Max did a lesson called Four Things That Everyone Can Do in Evangelism. And I talked with Brother Max about that, and I said, Max, I think there's a fifth one that we could add. And he said, yeah, you should do that, and you should preach it. So I said, okay, I'm going to do that. Five things every single person can do. Even our children can do these things. Five things, five words. Very simple lesson. I hope you'll follow with me this morning. First, every Christian can pray for evangelistic opportunities. Everyone can pray. I'm afraid that we have sold prayerful evangelism really short. Well, you know, the least you can do is pray for evangelism opportunities. And we kind of say it with that snarky tone, as if prayer doesn't really do very much, but at least you could do something, right? That is not the way the New Testament writers viewed prayer when it came to evangelism. It was not the least important thing that they could do. It was one of the most important things that could be done. In Matthew chapter 9 and in verse 36, this is what Jesus instructs us. In Matthew 9, 36, the text says, Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. And he said to his disciples that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of harvest to send out workers into the harvest. Jesus says the best thing that we can do is pray to God that workers would go out into the harvest. Jesus is not minimizing prayer. Yes, he talks about workers going out and taking advantage of the opportunities, but he says let's pray that there would be workers to meet the need. In Acts chapter 6, Acts chapter 6, we'll not discuss this in any great length because we looked at it a few weeks ago when we considered some thoughts about deacons. But in Acts chapter 6, you remember the situation There are these widows in the church who are being neglected in the daily distribution of the food. And this is brought before the apostles. And the apostles said, this is not good for us to see to this. We have a work to do that's been given to us by Christ. We would be neglecting the word of God in order to serve tables, they said in verse 2. And so they they come up with this this plan to deal with this matter. They're going to choose seven people that the congregation will choose. But notice in verse 4, the apostles said, we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the teaching of the word. We need to be preaching the word of God, but we also need to be devoted to prayer. Notice how those two things are linked together, prayer and preaching, prayer and teaching the word of God. And finally, turn to Colossians chapter 4. Uh, Don't get excited. Finally, with this point, not finally, the sermon's almost over, okay? Colossians chapter 4, go ahead and put your marker here, because we're going to come back to Colossians 4 in just a moment, but notice what Paul says here, Colossians 4 and verse 2, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying, and here he's going to tell them what to pray for. Praying at the same time for us as well that God will open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ. Pray that we would have opportunities to preach the gospel. The first century disciples believed in prayerful evangelism. 
If people were going out to preach, their preaching should be accompanied by prayer. Their preaching would be made successful because the saints are praying for its success. And that is something that every single one of us can do. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, if you are a child or an adult, all of us can pray for opportunities. So what might that prayer sound like? Well, especially as we think about all of these visitors that continue coming to our services, maybe what we should be praying about is that the visitors who come would be open and receptive to the teaching of the word of God that is heard from the pulpit, that they would accept an invitation to a Bible study so that they could hear the word of God taught in a one-on-one situation. We could be praying that they would have hearts that are seeking the Lord and that if their hearts are seeking the Lord, then let's pray that we would have the hearts to seek them, to show them to the Lord. All of us can pray. Here's a second thing we can do. We can shine. This little light of mine, right? Isn't that what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5? He said, let your light so shine before men that they will see your good works and they will glorify your Father who is in heaven. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, Paul writes to the Philippian church and he says that you live in a dark world, but you are shining as lights in the dark world. Perhaps the greatest evangelistic teaching method in our arsenal is the life of of a dedicated Christian. The life of a serious Christian who is wanting to serve the Lord every day in the workplace. Serving the Lord every day at home. It might be an unbelieving spouse, right? And that dedicated wife or that dedicated husband through their example might bring their spouse to Christ, might bring their children to Christ. It may be a child who is going to school every day letting his light shine, letting Her light shine brightly in the school. People in the world are always watching us. They will notice our attitudes. They hear the words we speak. They see our actions. They are watching us. And if we are living as we ought to live, if we are shining our light as Christian people should, people will notice our different behavior. I'm going to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter says in 1 Peter 2 and in verse 12, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. Keep your behavior excellent among those who are non-believers. Because those non-believers will see your deeds. They will see your attitudes and your actions. And they may come to honor Christ because of your character before them. There is no calculating how many people have come to Christ simply because a Christian in their life was living a godly and righteous life before them. Modeling the attitudes and the behavior of Christ Every one of us can shine our light every day. And you can reach the lost in this community. You can reach the people who visit our assemblies. You can reach the co-workers, your schoolmates. You can reach people simply by living the way God calls you to live. And you're not even thinking about, well, I'm going to live this way so I can go out and convert people. You may not even be thinking that necessarily, but it can happen. When your life and my life is what it ought to be. I'm coaching Hallie's soccer team. I've coached Kinley's teams a couple of times. Seeing me coach soccer is, is maybe, I, this, I don't know, this may be one of the most embarrassing things that I've done. I don't know anything about soccer, all right? What I know about soccer, as my dad used to say, can be written on a post-it note. And a small one at that, okay? I, 
I don't know the strategy. I don't understand it. But when my children are five and six and seven, you, you know, what is it they say? Fake it till you make it, right? I can do that. I can fake it with five and six and seven-year-olds. I can coach them. But as they get a little bit older, you know, they need actual teaching. They, they need people who know what they're talking about. I'm not that person. I can coach them when they're young. But the things that I'm coaching them are very simple things. This is your position. That is not. Stay over here. Don't go over there. Don't use your hands. You know, those kinds of simple things, right? But coaching youth sports could potentially open you up to some times when, well, maybe your light ain't shining as brightly as it needs to. And there's a whole bunch of circumstances that could contribute to that. And if you've ever coached youth sports, you understand. It may be that the children are not listening to you and you're trying to, you know, corral those cats and herd them up and you can't do it because they're not listening. Kind of grates on your nerves a little bit. Um, and it, Hallie's team has not done that, by the way. But um, it may be parents. There may be parents who are a little bit overly involved. And, boy, if I could just tell you what I really wanted to tell you, then I... I wouldn't have to mess with you for the rest of the season, right? But we're not going to do that, are we? We're not going to do that because we are disciplined. We, we are controlled by the Spirit of Christ. And so we're going to shine. It may be hard, but we're going to shine. And each one of us can do that. Here's a third thing. We can speak. We can speak. And I know what you're thinking. No, I can't do that. You said every person here could do that. I can't do it because speak means teach. No, it doesn't. That's not what I mean. When I use the word speak, I am not saying you have to be able to sit down with someone one-on-one -on -one at the coffee shop across from the table and walk them through Genesis to Revelation. That's not what I mean when I say speak. When I use that word, here's what I mean. I told you to put your marker in Colossians 4. Did you do that? Colossians chapter 4. We've already read the first couple of verses where Paul asked the Colossians to pray for open doors. But now notice what he says in verse 5. Colossians 4 and verse 5. Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. Our speech is to be seasoned with salt. Our speech is to be sprinkled with gracious words and thoughts as we interact with others. We talk about things that we're interested in. And it comes naturally to us, doesn't it? Grandparents don't do this anymore. But it used to be that grandparents would carry around wallets billfolds or purses and they would be filled with not money but pictures of the grands right and you'd pull out that billfold and you say let me show you some pictures of my grands and you'd open it up and then like an accordion unfolding it would roll all the way to the ground and you'd have your pictures of your grandkids and you'd start at the top and you'd go all the way down I've got pictures of them when they were newborns, and now they're 18, and I have pictures of all the years in between, and let me tell you about my grandkids. It comes naturally, doesn't it, for grandparents to talk about their grandkids. It comes naturally for us to talk about college football, doesn't it, Jimmy? Is there anything you've ever seen on my person that would indicate that it's easy for me to talk about? Is there anything you've ever seen on my person it's easy to talk about college football. It's easy to talk about the things that we're interested in. Maybe it's politics or hunting or fishing or golf or whatever it might be. We talk about those things because they captivate our interest. We talk about those things naturally. It is not hard to talk about those things. But what about sprinkling our conversations with people with spiritual salt? Does that come easy for us? Is it easy for us to, to just make little comments to someone when they tell us what's going on in their life? Maybe they're talking about an upcoming surgery or, or some kind of physical pain that they're experiencing. Is it easy for us to say, I'd like to 
pray for you about that. Could, could we pray together? Could we do that? Point number one, right? Pray. Is it easy to, to sprinkle that into the conversation? I'm sorry you're having such a hard time. I, I'm going to be praying for you. That's not teaching. That's not formal Bible study, but that's sprinkling our speech with spiritual salt. Or maybe someone has recently lost a loved one, and you might be able to say, you know, I, I went through that myself not all that long ago, and here were some passages of Scripture that really helped me. I'd like to share those with you. That's not formal Bible study, but it's speaking spiritual things into the conversation. Or maybe a coworker has some kind of health issue, and, and maybe you've got some experience with this. And you might be able to say, you know, three years ago, I went through that very same thing, and I wouldn't have made it if it wasn't for my church family. Now, listen, that has to be true, okay? Let's not lie about it as we try to speak spiritual things into the conversation. But if it's true, interject that. Put that into the conversation. You're sprinkling spiritual seeds into the conversation. And people remember that. Haven't there been times when you might have said something like that to another person? And then months go by. And they come back to you later and they say... You know, I'm, I'm kind of going through something right now. Would you pray for me? A long time ago, you said something to me, and, and I know that you're a believer. Would you pray for me? People remember those kinds of things. Perhaps nothing comes from it. Perhaps something does. It may not be immediate. But you just plant that little seed. Let them know that, that you are a spiritually minded person, that you're a believer in Christ Jesus, that he is important in your life. And when you put that into the conversation, people notice. You can speak. And you may have opportunities to do that every day. Here's a fourth thing we can do. Invite. Invite. Everybody can extend an invitation. You know who the best people at extending invitations are oftentimes? Children. Children are incredible inviters. And so when there is something going on in our congregation, it might be something like a VBS or a special Bible class kind of thing that's geared towards the children. Unleash the children. Let them go. Give them flyers and say, Pass these out to everybody, and they will do it because children are not embarrassed like we are. Well, I mean, if I go up and if I extend this invitation, they, they might reject it. They might laugh at me. They might say, oh, man, I'm, I don't want any part of this. I, I, oh, oh, well, here comes Ben again. Last time he tried to hand me some piece of paper inviting me to something. I'm just going to avoid him now for the rest of my life. Children don't worry about that. They just go up and they say to a total stranger, hey, you want to come to my church? We got a cool thing going on. You should come. It's great. Children are amazing at extending invitations. Invitations don't have to be complicated. And this is biblical. I'm going to John chapter 1. Let me show you a simple invitation. In fact, it's only three words. John chapter 1. You see this simple invitation extended two times in this chapter. In John chapter 1... John the Baptist is going along with some of his disciples, and in verse 36, he points their attention to Jesus. And so verse 37 says that the two disciples of John heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Can I stop for just a moment and point you back to the previous point? The two disciples of John, after they heard him, what? Speak. John didn't sit down and have a formal Bible study with them that took three hours. He said, hey, you see that man over there? That's the Lamb of God. That's Jesus. And they went and they followed. John spoke, and they went and they sought Jesus. And so Jesus, in verse 38, turned and saw them following. He said, what do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, where are you staying? And he said to them, come and see. A simple three-word invitation. Come and see. Drop down to verse 43. The next day, Jesus purposed to go into Galilee, and he found Philip. 
And Jesus said to him, follow me. And Philip was from Bethsaida of the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, come and see. What good thing could ever come out of Nazareth? Now, notice that Philip doesn't launch into a defense of who Jesus is. He doesn't say, well, Nathaniel, let's sit down with our Bibles and let's study for hours and hours, and I will explain to you why I think this is Jesus. I mean, that would have been great. But all Philip did is simply say, well, why don't you just come with me and check it out and see for yourself? Come and see. Both Jesus and Philip extended simple invitations and captured the interest of spiritual seekers. Our invitations will be most successful among people that we know already. I mentioned children could invite total strangers. Yeah, they could. You could too. But that's not where our success is going to be. We understand that. Invitations are, are more meaningful to those who are already our friends, our neighbors, and co-workers. People whom we know personally. People who know that we're not trying to take advantage of them in some way. People who know that we're not shark salesmen who are trying to get their money and, and, and pull the wool over their eyes somehow or take advantage of them. We're not doing that. They have, as Brother Harold Comer used to say, they have already morally certified who we are. They know enough about us to know that we're nice people, that we are good people, that we're serious people. And when we extend an invitation, they see us as someone who's trustworthy, someone who is genuine, and that invitation will mean something to them because they can trust the person from whom it came. Many of us live in subdivisions. There's children all over your subdivision. They're walking down the sidewalk. They're riding their bikes in the streets. Maybe your children play with those children. Maybe you know the parents. Could you extend an invitation to those families and say, you know, we have some great Bible classes at our church. Why don't you bring your kids sometime? Come to worship with us. They would love being in Bible class with our children and with all of the other ones. You don't know where that invitation might go. It might be that the family is saying, well, you know, we moved here eight, nine months ago, and we haven't found a church home yet, and we know that we should. We've been talking about that. We just haven't really known where to start. There's only 12 million options around here, so what should we do? Maybe they'll accept your invitation. Maybe there's some special event coming up in the church. In a month, we have a gospel meeting. Now, this is not the best example to use because we've kind of said this is going to be a meeting that focuses in-house, if you will. But maybe there's some special event where we're trying to reach out into the community. And we've invited a speaker to come who's going to be talking about topics that are interesting or we think they'll be interesting to people in the community. And we could invite them, say, hey, there's a topic coming up I think you, you might have some interest in. Why don't you come? Extend that invitation. Brother Max tells a story about uh, a person who visited their services in Texas one time. And uh, she was a first-time visitor. She worked at the local Walmart. She wor worked at the cash register. And they said to her, well, ma'am, we're so glad that you came. Uh, thank you for, for accepting the invitation. Um, how did you find out about this? And she said, well, every time I was working at Walmart, some of your members would come by and they handed me a card and invited me. I must have gotten 36 of those cards. I figured there must be something worth checking out. A simple invitation. A little business card with some information on it. They didn't have to say anything. They didn't stand there at the register for an hour walking them through the scriptures. They just simply extended an invitation with a five cent card. Maybe you've had religious conversations with people at work. You've talked about spiritual things with them, but you found that you are still at work and you can't just take two hours of company time and stop working. And you thought, you know, I'd really like to talk with them some more. How could you go about doing that? 
Maybe you could extend an invitation to them. Why don't you come to my house one night next week, bring your Bible, and let's just sit down and read the Bible together. You don't have to formally teach them anything. You don't have to give them a handout that has nine points of material worth considering. Hey, bring your Bible. Let's just read through Matthew chapter 5 together and just read the text. Anybody can do that, right? A child who's five, six years old can do that. Invite. Extend an invitation. Everybody can do that. And here's the fifth thing. Welcome people when they come. When people accept our invitations, we need to welcome them warmly. I'm going to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 because I feel a little bit like the Apostle Paul here. And I'll explain what I mean after we read this text. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and in verse 9, Paul writes, Now as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. For indeed you do practice it toward all the brethren who are in Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, to excel still more. Paul says, I want you to love each other. But what's curious to me and what's interesting is the fact that he says, I don't even need to tell you that. You don't need somebody to write to you and tell you to love each other. You're already doing it. You've already been taught that and you're practicing that. You are displaying that to brethren all over your region. I don't need to tell you that. And a moment ago when I said, I feel a little bit like Paul, this is what I mean. I don't need to tell this church how to welcome visitors. You do that so well. Joe and I can attest, the elders will tell you that all of these people who have placed membership with us in recent months, they have said to us, this is such a friendly group. We felt at home here from the moment we came in the door. We feel so comfortable here. People are so kind to us here. It isn't uncommon for people who are visiting with us to walk out the door with Ken Hensley as he's locking up the place and he's the last one to leave because there are so many people in the congregation who are talking to them and getting to know them, asking them questions. Where are you from? Tell us about your family. Oh, you're new to the area. Well, how can we help you? What can we help as you're trying to make adjustments to this area? You do that so well. And so I'm not going to stand up here and tell you, you know, you need to greet visitors. You need to do a better job of welcoming people. No, you're doing an amazing job. But what I am going to say to you, as Paul did to the Thessalonians at the end of verse 10, excel still more. Don't stop doing that. Keep it up. That's one of the things that is attractive. But I think we need to appreciate what it takes for visitors to come to an assembly. I think sometimes we maybe lose sight of how difficult it is to come to church. So try to flip this around and think about this from the visitor's perspective. Have you ever gone into a new city before and maybe sought out a local church and you walked in to worship with that church? How did you feel? It's a place you've never been before. You don't know a soul in that building. How did you feel? Did it make you a little nervous? Were you a little apprehensive about it? Now imagine how visitors feel when they come here. And they see an assembly of people, well over 200 in number, but 200 plus people that they don't know. 250 people that they don't know. How do you think they feel? 
maybe they have no idea what to expect. Well, what do they do in this church? Well, what's their worship like? What should be my expectation? And they have no idea what to think. But if you will receive them warmly and kindly, it will help settle their anxieties. It says something about them when they receive an invitation and they come. It says something about them, doesn't it? Sometime back, the elders mentioned, I think it was Ben's five-minute rule. All right? Some of these ideas is where that rule came from. In an effort to reach more visitors, we have to look around and notice the visitors. And so what I had hoped to do was to say after the closing prayer, after the closing amen, everybody look around and find a visitor and spend five minutes talking to a visitor before you started talking to your friends. Now, obviously, that can't be done. If we've got 250 people who are present who are members here or, or 230 people who are members and we've got 20 visitors, I mean, I'm, math, okay? <laughs> I'm not great at math, but I know 20, 230, that, I know that doesn't work. I get it. But if there's a visitor near you, greet them. Take an interest in them. Have casual conversation with them. Ask simple questions. I mean, don't ask them their medical history, Okay. You know, we're not trying to probe. We're not trying to insert ourselves in places that we shouldn't. But simple questions. People appreciate that. And you do so well at that. Keep it up. Excel still more in that effort. Five things we can all do to evangelize. Pray. Shine. Speak. Invite. And welcome. All of us can do it. All of us must do it. Because we want to see people come to Christ. I said this to you recently, but I'm going to say it again because it's important. We're not interested in numbers as such. It's not about numbers. It's about what the numbers represent, and that's the soul's. That's what we're interested in. We want souls. We want people to know Christ. And these are five things that all of us can do to assist in that effort. This morning, there may be someone here who's not a Christian. We are worried about your soul. We're not just worried about having your body in a seat so that we can count higher numbers. We're not just worried about the green money that you might put into the collection plate because we're interested in money. That's not what we're interested in. We're interested in seeing you go to heaven. We're interested in seeing you be right with the Lord. And that doesn't matter if you are a member here of this church or if you move to another state and you worship with God's people in another place. We rejoice that you know Christ. But if you don't know him, we want to help you in that. Talk to me. Talk to the elders. Talk to Joe. We will study. We will help you understand what God's word has to say so that you can become his child. That's what we want for you more than anything else. And if we can help you in that, we invite you. Please come as we stand and sing together.